Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good morning, everyone. It is Saturday, July the 24th, 2021. It is currently 9.35 a.m. Central Time. And once again, I'm coming to you live from the studios of the Theology Central Podcast. And when I say studios, I mean a little table set up in the back of a sanctuary inside a church that is located in the middle of nowhere, Texas. So I can say studio because it sounds like, whoa, I'm listening to a very professional podcast. So I could say that (laughs) to make myself look more important than I really am. In reality, it's just me, a sinner, sitting in front of a microphone, like I said, in a church in the middle of nowhere, Texas, talking about, well, what's going on within Christianity, what's happening in the church, talking about theology, talking about life. It's just me trying to figure out how to live this thing we call the Christian life. And I invite you every time I turn on the microphone to stop what you're doing, sit down, and well, let's have a discussion. Let's talk about it. Let's 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 try to understand this whole thing we call Christianity. Let's study the Bible. Let's look to that. And we try to do a lot of things. And hopefully you find all of the conversations to be helpful and beneficial. I, I hope you do. I know it's been a couple of days since I've been here in front of the microphone. Last time I was here was Wednesday evening where we looked at Joel chapter 2 and Acts chapter 2. I hope you found that study to be somewhat beneficial. It's, uh, we left, we ended that with more questions than I think we had answers. I, well, I don't know. I did a lot. I think I did a lot there trying to, to provide us some, some basic foundation, a kind of a foundational starting point to try to figure out some of those things. But hopefully you found that to be interesting. And then I was, um, I, I took two days off because, well, it was my anniversary, 31 years I have been married. So, um, I took two days off and now here I, I'm back. Now I will be here a couple of hours today. Now, tomorrow will be, um, it's going to be a little different tomorrow. Here's how things are going to work, all right? People are driving by honking. Okay, thank you. I, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Thank you for honking your horn. Okay, welcome. <laughs> okay, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. So I, I, I'll wave. I, yes, if you were listening to me live as you just drove by and started honking your horn, thank you for tuning in. Whoever you are, I, I greatly appreciate that. That was That was kind of odd. Okay, so... Back to what I was saying. Tomorrow, um, obviously, Sunday school at 10 a.m. If you want to listen, make sure. If you want to listen live, have the Spreaker app, and we'll be uh, back in the Niagara Creed. Basically, we're working through the Catholic Catechism and what it teaches in regards to the church. I won't go through everything that we're doing. I know you're like, wait a minute, what's going on? Yeah, just tune in. It'll be an interesting study. Then at 11 a.m., well, probably about 11.20 a.m., once again, on the Spreaker app, under the VBC podcast, we'll be looking at Romans chapter 8. We're looking at six words every Christian uh, should know. And right now we're working on the word foreknowledge. And uh, so definitely tune into that. Hopefully you'll find that to be interesting. Now, typically on Sundays, I come back in the afternoon and do hours of live broadcasting. That will not happen this Sunday because I have a friend, a family coming in from Nebraska who's going to be here. And then they're going to be at our uh, Sunday evening. I don't know how many people are going to be here Sunday evening, but they're going to be here Sunday evening for whoever is here. And then we're going to have hopefully a good study in Matthew chapter 9 Sunday night. And that will be live streamed as well. So the Sunday afternoon hours of live broadcasting will not occur so just, you know, mark your calendars because I know, I know your calendar really, it's all based on what I'm doing, right? I mean, you're like, oh, oh, I'm supposed to go to someone's wedding. Wait, he's going to be live broadcasting. I'm not going to their wedding. Oh, wait, I'm supposed to go to someone's, I'm sorry, I can't go to their funeral. He's live broadcasting. I know you base everything. Okay. Or the reality is you, you don't really care when I'm live on the air because you'll listen when you want to listen because, well, that's the way things work in 2021, right? You watch TV on your schedule, not the network schedule. You watch what you want. You listen to what you want. In many cases, you go to church when you want. So uh, that's kind of the way our culture is. So, But that's what's going on for those who are interested in listening live. Um, I don't want people going, wait, it's Sunday afternoon, and he's not live on the air. And then I get those emails going, what's going on? So that's what's been happening. That's what will happen. 
But please uh, feel free to join us tomorrow for three live broadcasts, Sunday school, Sunday morning, and Sunday night. Hopefully that will be beneficial. And then I probably will not be back live on the air till Tuesday. Um, And then we'll try to catch up on what we are behind. But we've got a lot to do right now. Now, are you ready? Okay. That kind of gets us a little bit of a... Get, that gets us caught up. That lets you know what's going on behind the scenes. Now we have a lot to talk about. Now, here's how I want to introduce this. I have an audio clip here. And when I play this audio clip, I have a feeling that some of you are going to be like, so what? Big deal. Why is he playing that? I don't even understand. Like you, you may not even see the significance of it. But what you need to know is when I heard the audio clip, my reaction was completely different. I got, I got upset. I got angry. I got mad. I, I literally wanted to find the name of this pastor and call him and go, man, I know what that's like. I, 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 I feel bad for you. In fact, can I come to your church and can I speak? Because I would like to tell everyone there what I think. But you're not going to understand that. Feel. You're going to be like, why would he get so upset about that? It, it's no big deal. But it's a big deal to me. All right. And here, and I think this is very important. This audio clip is going to demonstrate the difference of, or, or the different perspective of those maybe standing behind the pulpit and those sitting in the pew. We've talked about this in some of the podcasts we've done about preaching, which was to spark a conversation. Some of you have participated in that conversation, and it's been very beneficial because, once again, I've got to hear the perspective of those who sit in the pew. But remember, in every church, there are two very different perspectives, the perspective of the one standing behind the pulpit and the perspective of those sitting in the pew. And sadly, many times those perspectives are very, very much in conflict. They don't see things the same way. And this audio clip that you're getting ready to listen to, oh, from someone who stands behind the pulpit, this makes me absolutely want to scream and get upset. And here's the reason why. And, and I think here's the ultimate question. What do church members actually want? And then this is very important. What do church members actually need? Here's another question. And what should be actually required for church members? Now, this is a very important uh, question. This third one, what should actually be required? I think this is an important question, and I think a lot of the difficulties that arise within church may, a lot of it may be because of this third question. I can't speak for you, but when, and all of the years that I've been a Christian, I don't care what discipleship material I pick up, I don't care what church I go to, I, I've heard the same thing over and over and over and over, that as a Christian, it is required, it is my responsibility to have a daily time with God, I need to have a daily devotion, I need to be involved in Bible study, I need to be reading the Bible, I need to be memorizing the Bible, I need to be studying the Bible, I need to desire the sincere milk of God's word that I may grow thereby, I need to study to show myself approved. I need to be meditating on God's word day and night. The scriptures, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That if I am going to claim to be a Christian, I need to be reading my Bible, studying my Bible. I need to be listening to sermons. I need to be, I need, that. that's, that's just, not only is it expected, that is what is required. And if I'm not doing those things, not only am, is my Christianity called into question, I'm not going to grow as a Christian and I'm going to actually be hurting myself. I've heard, now it may be expressed sometimes in a very blunt way, maybe sometimes in a more encouraging way, but that is the basic philosophy I have been given my entire Christian life. Now, here's the question. Has the church been wrong to present it that way? Has the church been placing a requirement and a burden upon the average church member that we should not be put, pl- be placing on people. And if it is a requirement, and if all of that, if the, that, the way it's stated is actually true, then what do pastors and churches do when church members are not studying the Bible? They're not reading the Bible. They're not memorizing the Bible. They're not doing any of that. Do you just say, well, you know, we'll keep trying. Is it, is it a sin? It, it, does it matter? These are some very important questions, and we're going to discuss 
all of these and just kind of a, a more of a conversational kind of way, not in a teaching way. And then, of course, I'm going to open it up for you to give me your thoughts and perspectives. And again, your perspective is the one we need. Because you're the you're giving me the perspective from the person sitting in the pew, and sometimes I don't understand your perspective. I'm sometimes baffled and confused by it. But here we go. I want you to hear this. I know you're going to be like, wait a minute, that made him upset. I will explain, all right? I want you to listen to this. The volume is not great for this. I have it cranked to 100, but um, I think the reason the volume is not great here is because what you're getting ready to hear is... We're getting ready to listen to, uh, a, a, basically, it's a church service. Um, maybe maybe it's a Sunday school class. I don't know exactly. It's inside a church. And clearly, they're doing a study and what they're calling an effective walk with God. It's kind of like a discipleship course, an effective walk with God. And obviously, in the church, they've handed out material, right, for people to do. That, that sets it up. Now, I want you to listen to this. Oh, and I, and, I, and while this is playing, I'm going to have to run and grab my bag because I have something that I just received in the mail that I think will fit with this whole discussion. So are you ready? We may have to back this up two or three times. I, I, if we were to listen to this together, it would be funny. I really wish this the sanctuary right now was filled with people and I could just play this over the speakers and and, and ask, and, 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 and if my church members were here going, hey, what do you think about that? And they'd be like, about what? They probably would look at me like, I don't even know what is significant about what you just played. They, they, they probably wouldn't even get it. I think there's a lot of you who will not get this. Oh, oh, oh. but I, oh, I, I thought I was going to have a heart attack and a stroke because this kind of stuff bothers me so much. I, I will explain here in just a second. Here we go. All right, perfect. We'll get those to you before the service is over or at the end of service. Uh, thank you for being patient. Uh, now, let's do this. If you have yours from last week, go ahead and hold it up and fold it. Brother Joe will get it from you and get it to me. And again, I'm not grading you on this. Uh, this is more so um, just to, to kind of understand um, if it's working for you, for, for me, for your sake. Is it working? Are you growing uh, in this study? Are you growing in your walk with God? So as you have that, hold it up, okay, if you would. Uh, there's just a couple of you. Hopefully you filled it out, um, if you would. Da, 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 da. Brother Joe, did you get anybody? Did anybody do it? Heartbroken. Okay, now, I'm going to play this again. I know it's a very low volume. I really do apologize for this. It, it didn't sound as low when I played it uh, the first time, but... Once you download the file and upload it into the software, it's that low. So let me explain kind of what's going on here, right? Now, I know, again, you're probably going, so what? No, it, it's, it's a big what. All right, so here we go. Here's a church. They're trying to do something to help the people grow in their faith. They're trying to do something to equip people, right? They're having this thing called an effective walk with God. And they've handed out material, study material for people to do. Now, it's, it's, I don't know how many, I think this is class three. So maybe this is week three of this program. Three weeks in, it's class, it's called class three. So I'm assuming three weeks in, three weeks in. I mean, you're still new. It's still brand new. And so he's like, okay, we're going to make sure we hand out the new booklet, the new study guide to everyone. All right. Now, right now, if you've got yours from last week, hold it up. You kind of hear a pause. He's like, duh, 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 duh. and he's looking around. You can tell he's looking around and he's like, wait a minute. Did, did you get any? And then he's like heartbroken. Now he's trying to be nice about it. But basically what he just discovered is what many pastors discovered. No one did anything. No one did anything. Now, I think there's at least one person in the church, at least one, there may have been two, who actually did the work. And, and listen and wait for this. Guess what it's going to be? It sounds like the person who did actually complete the work, guess what, was a woman. I have seen this my whole career. Where are the men? Now, it's a woman who probably went home, read, did the actual study. Where, where are the men? Why is it a woman? And my and my and my ministry, it's constantly I have discovered it's women 
who do the reading. It's women who do the studying. It's, now, there are, there are always exceptions, but I'm saying if I look at the majority, I don't, I don't understand that. No, I've yet have anyone exp- – what I've always found is men get offended when I point that out. Men get angry, but, but they can't explain to me why it's always that way. So I'm going to play this again. And I know it sounds insignificant to you, but we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about it because this goes down to what do church members actually want? What do they need? And what should be actually required? All right. So let's play this. I'm going to back it up. I'm going to let you hear all of this. Again, I'm sorry the volume is so low. I wish I could do something about it, but here we go. All right, perfect. We'll get those to you before the service is over or at the end of service. Uh, Thank you for being patient. Uh, Now, let's do this. If you have yours from last week, go ahead and hold it up and fold it. Brother Joe will get it from you and get it to me. And again, I'm not grading you on this. Uh, This is more so um, just to kind of understand um, if it's working for you, for for me, for your sake. Is it working? Are you growing uh, in this study? Are you growing in your walk with God? So as you have that, hold it up, okay, if you would. Uh, There's just a couple of you. Hopefully, you filled it out, um, if you would. Da, 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 da. Brother Joe, did you get anybody? Did anybody do it? Heartbroken. All right, we're, we're getting ready to go to the Bible memory verse. Hopefully it's more encouraging than it was last week. If not, I'm changing my lesson on hell, and uh, we're going to teach on hell tonight. Um, all right, if you, so you, this is, you're handing them out, correct? You're still handing them out? All right, this is just for the collection side. I think we're out of them. If you have yours to turn in, hold yours up. Joe's collecting those. No, don't put your name on it. Don't put your name on it. If your name's on it, scribble it out, and I'll know whose it was that scribbled it out. (laughs) Well, considering there's only two this week, Angie, I'm probably going to know whose is yours. Come on. All right, we'll, uh, we'll save that rebuke for the end. All right, great. All right, this is encouraging, church family. Praise the Lord. All right, let's talk about this for a minute. I'm, I'm hoping... Now you, you can hear... Now, see, from, from a pastor's perspective, I can hear his frustration. He's like, come on. Okay, all right, I'll save that rebuke for later. Okay, this is encouraging. He's trying to press on. He's trying to like, okay, because part of... I guarantee there's, there's something inside of him that wants to go, what... Because right there, he, he realizes that it, he's, he has to at least be thinking... Are my efforts just completely in vain? What is even the point? What am I even trying to do here? Why are we spending money on booklets? Why are we spending, why am I spending my time? And then two people, I don't know how big the church is. Okay, I don't know. And of course, at least one of them, it's the name of the individual, Angie. So it's a female. So the female did, she did her work. Nobody else. Nobody else. Else. Now, maybe I think there may have been one other person. We don't know who they, who there were. Maybe it was a man. Maybe. But when I heard that, I was like, this is literally a perfect example of some of the problems in the church. All right. So let's go through this. All right. Let, let's just consider this. All right. Here we go. Every statistic that we get looking at the church, we find the following. We find that the church in America is absolutely drowning in biblical illiteracy. Christians don't know their Bible. They don't, obviously, they don't study their Bible. They don't have a a biblical worldview. They don't know theology. They don't know doctrine. They don't know church history. And it's just, and everyone keeps calling it, and it's an epidemic. It's a disaster. It's a crisis. We've got to do something about it. And you hear it over and over and over and over and over. Now, when you point this out, right, when you point this out that this is a problem, this is a problem, this is a problem, many in the church sitting in the pew, they point their finger at the church and go, well, my church doesn't teach in depth. My, my church doesn't, you know, they're, they're, the preaching is shallow and they blame the church, which I have done over and over and over as well. I blame churches because I listen to countless hours of preaching and sometimes like, are you serious? That's how you're going to handle that text. And I do believe there's a lot of shallow preaching. I do believe there's a lot of shallow teaching. I do believe the church bears a great level of responsibility, but at the same time, I want to make sure we don't forget that the people in the pew, oh, there's a lot to, a lot of blame to go around. Number one, they typically will go to the churches that give them shallow preaching if the following exists. Nice building, 
larger, right, where there's lots of programs and activities and ministries and the kids can go to this and they can go to this and they will many they will complain all day that the preaching is shallow, but they will rarely leave that nice little big church with all of their programs and activities and their little social club to go find that little small church, maybe in a little small building, doesn't look very attractive, may look very embarrassing to even tell people that you go there, but the teaching is in depth and the doctrine and there's theology. They won't do that. So do they really want that kind of in-depth teaching? Do they really, really, really want that? Because I will, I have found over and over and over that people say that that's what they want, but in reality, they do not. So, so there's problem number one. Many will just stay at the larger church because they like the, the building and they like all the activity. They won't actually sacrifice in any way, shape, or form to go find that little small church. They won't, they won't sacrifice to go there. They won't support it. They won't do anything. They just stay in their nice little comfortable big church with all their nice comfortable little programs and then complain, well, I'm just not being fed and I'm just not being fed. And, don't, and they don't do a thing about it. All right. So there, there's, I think, a problem number one. And, and that one really, 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 really really frustrates me because, uh, you know, go, go support, go find those churches that are doing it the right way. Go, go do what you can to support them. Because if you don't, then there's not going to be those churches that feed you. So, so there's, there's problem number one. Number two, and this I think is a big one. A lot, a lot of people claim they want that in-depth teaching. They want that, but then when they get into a church that does that, it's almost like they draw a line in the sand. Okay. You can go this in-depth you can give me this much teaching, but there's a line. And if you go beyond that, uh, I'm, I don't want now, now it's too academic. Now you went too deep. Now, now that's not what I want. So they say they want it, but they want it in a very, 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 very specific way. It's almost like they feel like they're standing, you know, at Starbucks and they're like, okay, I need a half of this and, and a, a, you know, a, a, a t- teaspoon of this. And, you know, whenever they do one of those coffees and they want like a half of this and a part of this and part of and they, so they want to give the pastor their menu and say, okay, in-depth teaching, yes, but only so much of this, a little bit of this, leave a little bit of that out, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. And when they don't, and so when that little church gives them too much of what they want, then they'll just say, forget it, and they'll go to another church where the teaching is far more shallow, and even though they claimed they wanted the in-depth teaching. So a lot of people say they want the in-depth teaching, but guess what? Guess what? <laughs> They they they'll stay at the big church where they don't get it. Then two, they some of them will go to one of those little small churches, and then all they want to do is micromanage exactly how much they get, like it's a Starbucks coffee order. And when they don't get what they want, they'll go right back to the kind of larger church where they can get all of the nice get, get what they want. All right. So what do church members really really want? Do they really want in depth teaching? And then here's what really drives me crazy. Here's number three. There are churches all across the United States of America that spend, I don't even know, if you take a collective of all the churches and all of the money spent on materials, it is probably in the millions of dollars that churches spend giving people Bible study guides, devotional guides, placing all kinds of material in the hands of people. I got right here, this is from Lifeway. Um, it says this, it's a, it's kind of like a, it's, it's like, a, I don't even know uh, what kind of paper this would be, but it folds out, it folds out. And so when it came into the mail and I opened the email box, this is what it said, or the email box. Uh, when I opened my email box, when I opened my mailbox, uh, this is what I found. The truth will set you free. And then above that is a Bible with the pages open. Then it says this, if you continue in my word, you really are my disciples. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. John chapter eight, verses 31 to 32. Under that, it says, explore the Bible, right? Then I open it up, the whole truth, book by book. In today's world, there are many conflicting truths competing for acceptance, but there is only one universal standard of truth around which uh, which people of all ages, races, and cultures can unite, the word of God. Explore the Bible. Uh, uh, Explore the Bible. Uh, Adults is designed to illuminate the historical, culture, and biblical context of Scripture. 
Book by book, we help men and women understand and apply God's word in a manner that is practical, sustainable, uh, through uh, an age appropriate uh, and uh, age appropriate, I guess is the way. Uh, okay, I'm coming. Let me read this again. Um, Explore the Bible, adults, is designed to illuminate this historical, culture, and b- cultural, and biblical context of Scripture. Book by book, we help men and women understand and apply God's word in a manner that is practical, sustainable, thorough, and age appropriate. Uh, the way some of this is written, they're, they're, they don't have commas where, yeah, there's a lot of issues here, but I'm not going to go through all that. So this is curriculum for the church. So what they have here, they give a, a list of all these things, a personal study guide, uh, use this tool for enhancing Bible study and applying what's learned. This tried and true approach also helps group members prepare for and contribute in group time. So this is a personal study guide. So the way this works is it's for either a Sunday school class or it's for a small group study. You buy every one of one of the personal study guides. They do the personal study guides and then you come back to the group time and then everyone's prepared to contribute and, and do so. They have a daily discipleship guide that people are to work on during the week. They have the leader's guide, all right? Then they have a leader pack. They have a quick source. They have a commentary. And then you can uh, you can buy a group box, which has a bunch of these for everyone in your group, all right? And so uh, this is called the uh, uh, Explore the Bible, uh, a Bible study guides for adults. Okay, now, here's the thing. You know how many churches buy that material from Lifeway? Probably thousands, who knows how much total money is spent? Do you know what I bet happens week after week after week after week? People have those study guides claiming that, hey, we, we, we want the word of God. We want some in-depth teaching. And you know what they do when they walk back into the church? They've not looked at it. They've not studied it. They've not done anything. They've had it in their possession. Now, you may see them walk in the church and open it up real quick and try to skim it so that they can look like they know what they're talking about. Oh, you may find them making an argument during Sunday school about what they agree or disagree with, even though they didn't actually do the study. Trust me, it happens all the time. I've witnessed this my whole Christian life, okay? For I'll start right when I was a teenager. Teenager, Sunday school class. They handed out this kind of curriculum to everyone. Now, I was a new Christian. They handed me the curriculum, and I'm like, okay, this is awesome. I got, some, I got something I can study during the week. I had my Bible. I had my notebook. I had my, my curriculum that they gave me. I had it marked up. I had questions. I had arrows drawn to this. I had, I, had, I had it all ready to go, and I came to Sunday school, and I was like, I'm ready. Let's do this. And then guess what? No one else in the classroom had even looked at it. No one actually cared. No one read it. No one did anything. And in many cases, what was even more frustrating is that the person teaching the Sunday school class, it looked like that they had not even looked at their guy, their, their, their curriculum until the night before, because in many cases, I knew more about it than they did. And I'm like, what is even the, what are we doing? This is all a waste of time. So finally, I, I get out of the, the teenage, you know, Sunday school situation. And I find myself an adult Sunday school situations. And guess what I find again? The same thing over and over and over. Here's some curriculum. Here's a book we're going to be studying. I, I can remember in Nebraska uh, at the church, there were a men's Sunday school classrooms. And, and there were at least two or three times they wanted us, they, they were going to study one of these like little Bible study guide books by John MacArthur. And I'm like, okay, I think one was about uh, spiritual warfare. I think one was about being a godly man. I can't remember. And I'm like, okay, I read them. We would show up and then, Guess what happened week after week after week? Not, all, not in every case, but in most cases, about 90% of the men who attended that Sunday school classroom did not read the book, did not pick up the book, didn't do anything. So could you have a meaningful discussion? Obviously, you could not. So what was the point of spending the money for those books? What was the point of doing that? So then, then you have to ask the question, what do the people really want? If they want in-depth teaching and your church is handing you all kinds of material. Now, you could argue, well, I want in-depth teaching from the pulpit. I understand that. But if you want in-depth teaching, you want in-depth teaching any way you can get it. And if they're literally handing you the curriculum that you can go and use and study, why would you not be doing that? Why would you not be taking 
every advantage of that. Now, I've experienced this as a pastor over and over and over again. And every time it just like, uh, what am I doing? I came up with this great idea that I think one summer, we were going to do it for a summer. Um, we get a, well, we used to hand them out. It was a devotional guide. Came in every quarter. The feature Bible study guide. It was more than a, it was like a Bible study guide. And what I loved about it is in some cases, like one one entire week will be over one passage of scripture. So in some cases, it's very, more of an exegetical kind of devotional guide. So I really like that about it. So we used to get them and ha- give them out to everyone in the church, right? Okay, we're spending that money, spending that money. Everyone had them. Now, what was the goal of doing that? Well, well, I, I wanted everyone reading them. And what I hoped was happening is that everybody would read them. And then during the week, they may be talking to other people in the church. Hey, did you see the devotional for Tuesday? Man. That was really convicting. I spent some time really looking at this and here's some things I found. Oh, wow, well, that's really good. That's, that was the vision, right? So to, to kind of motivate that, we did something. Everyone had the devotional guide. So what we would do is each Sunday school, we would do a test over that week's readings. I, uh, my daughter helped write the test and we would write a test out and it would be basic stuff. Like I can remember one week, the whole week, the reading was, uh, the, the passage was Philippians 2. That was the whole week. So I think the first question was, so what was this week's uh, uh, chapter and verse or or this week's uh, passage of scripture? And it was like 95% had no clue. Didn't even know. Didn't even know that it was Philippians 2 the entire week. And so it became obvious really quick. Guess what? We were spending money on those devotional guides, but nobody was actually using them. Nobody was actually studying them. And even when we were having a situation where you were coming to church and there was going to be a test, which was supposed to be for fun and supposed to be to encourage you using, it, it wasn't happening. So what was the point of spending the money? The, this Lifeway Bible study guide, we, we've tried those here as well. In fact, um, I have some, in fact, let me look here. Uh, well, I was getting ready to walk away from the microphone, which would not be very good uh, programming. But yeah, I have some, I think, in the back table. Maybe I threw them away. Uh, but we had, a, we had a bunch of them. And it was, again, everyone study them. Everyone study them. And I have witnessed, it, and, and obviously people who come to this church want in-depth teaching, but I have just seen over and over and over the absolute failure in all of these attempts. Now, you may have gone to church where they hand out curriculum and you've seen it work better. I would love to hear your success stories. Like, why did it work so well in your church? Why was it so successful? Was it because of the people in your Sunday school? Was it a small group? I want to hear your success stories. And I want to hear the the stories where it was just nobody was doing anything. In this church that we just listened to, why did no, no one came back with it ready to go? Why? Nobody. Two people, I guess. I guess two people. And you can hear the pastor like, oh. Come on, guys. Okay, I'll save that rebuke to the end. You, you can hear his frustration because he said the reason he wanted people to turn it in is so that he could see that it was helping. The people were growing. Nobody's doing them. That means you're wasting your time, man. Just give up. The whole program is a bust. The whole thing is a waste of stinking time. Go, you rather just ju- not even worry about, just just bring everyone in, give them some coffee and some donuts and just sit around and talk about the weather because it's about as useful as what you're doing. Now, church members, again, will complain all day that we're not being fed, we're not being fed, and then they won't go find the little church that will actually feed them. And in many cases, when they find the little church that will feed them, all they want is their, their Starbucks version of church where they can say, well, I need a little bit of that, a little less of that. A little, okay, well, you're not going to do what I want. I'll just go back to the big church where at least I can have all my fun and activities and do. Okay, so that doesn't work. And then number three, churches spend millions of dollars to give people actual put it in their hands curriculum and people won't use it at all. Now, all of that is said to express the frustration of me of someone standing behind the pulpit who have witnessed this. Now, sometimes I was the one sitting in the pew getting frustrated with everyone. I'll give you an example. Here's another example. A church in Nebraska, they they placed uh, right there before the pulpit, kind of according to the altar area, every, I think it was every month, maybe it was once a month, maybe once a quarter, it was a, a booklet with Spurgeon sermons, all right? 
And it would have like, I think it was some uh, devotionals from Spurgeon from uh, morning and evening. I think it had like two or three sermons. I can't remember. It was like a little booklet. I, w- I couldn't wait. Um, I was always excited. I come to church and I saw that. I was like, oh, awesome. And guess what? I took them and I read every single word, every single word. I had those things marked up. I had them. I, I, I got little, you know, those little, that little, what is it? Like posty notes or tabs. And I had it tabbed. I, 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 man, I used those. I used to have a collection of those things. I, I loved them, right? I'm like, okay, because I'm getting a Spurgeon sermon without having to go purchase any books. It's getting right here to me. I'm going to, and the church is giving it to me. I'm going to use it. Well, a big argument in the church er- erupted over the doctrine of election. It got ugly. It got bad. I won't go through the whole boring story. And I remember being brought into a meeting because I was getting in trouble for, I guess, studying the doctrine of election. And uh, basically, the pastor was like, you know, this church does not teach that. And I was like, wait, this church does not teach that? You've been putting Spurgeon sermons at the altar. And he's like, well, Spurgeon, was, and he tried to argue with me that Spurgeon did not believe in the doctrine of le- election. Spurgeon was not a Calvinist, which I don't know where you've been. I'm like, oh, really? I said, well, let me. And so I had, I think in a bag or had with me, I had sermons that he had handed out from. The, now, that means even the pastor was not reading them. I took them and I said, look, oh, here's one by Spurgeon called election. <laughs> okay, Here's a sermon that you handed to everyone in the church by Spurgeon called election. But you're right. This church doesn't teach that. You just handed out the teaching to everyone. So nobody in the church had even bothered to read it. Nobody. And so even the pastor was handing out stuff that even he wasn't reading. He wasn't even looking at. So what was the point of spending the money handing it all out? Nobody was using it. I've witnessed this countless times where the churches spend money and money and money trying to put material in hands and people's hands to help them grow to, and nobody uses it. So maybe we should just close all that whole industry where millions of dollars are being spent, just close it all down. Just churches stop spending money. Don't hand out that stuff. Don't hand out the curriculum. Nobody's going to use it anyway. And just don't give anyone anything. And you know what you're going to probably find? I could be wrong. I bet you 95% of the people, will, will, they won't even care. They won't even miss it. They won't, they're not going to say, man, we used to get those Bible study guides. I really missed. Nobody's going to ask for them. Nobody's going to care. It's not going to matter. So then you have to ask yourself this question. What do people really want? They usually stick in churches where they don't get the in-depth teaching while they complain that they don't get the in-depth teaching. If they do go to a small church, they want the in-depth teaching given to them exactly the way they want it, right? Okay, we want you to do it this way. And if they don't get that, they usually will leave and go back to a bigger church where they're getting the more shallow teaching. And then number three, when the churches bend over backwards and spend countless amounts of uh, uh, dollars to hand them actual curriculum, they won't read it, they won't study it, and they won't use it. So then you have to ask yourself, well, then what what are they doing? You have to ask yourself, what is going on? So what is the solution? So here... So, so there is, and again, I wish, I wish that audio was louder, but I, I hope you at least got an idea. I, I don't know if you could hear, at least for me, I can hear the pastor's frustration. You, you probably would have listened to that, not even thought anything about it. But for me, it's just like, oh boy, here we go again. Now, here's my question to you. And I really want to be, I want you to be as honest with me as you can. Do you think Christianity and pastors and churches has placed a requirement upon people that isn't biblical. Let me, let me explain. Is it possible that all of the talk in, in churches, from the pulpit, a discipleship material that basically tells Christians, you need, you, know, you need to spend daily time with God. You need to have a daily time with God. You need to read. You need to pray. You need to, you know, you need to study the Bible. You need to do a devotional time. You need to, you know, listen to sermons that, that basically this kind of, that you need this daily time with God's word. We've almost made that like a requirement. Do you think that we have 
basically acted like Pharisees and placed a burden upon people that isn't biblical or scriptural. Maybe the approach should be, hey, you're a Christian, do whatever you want to do, come to church, because, you know, at least church, I think we could say is biblical. I mean, you're supposed to come to church, right? Right? Forsake not the assembly. I think we would, we could argue that churches, I mean, the whole New Testament is written to local churches, you're supposed to show up to a local church. I think we could say that, that is a requirement. And I think you could, you know, I think you could argue that the Lord's day would be the, the, the requirement. Now you could argue that the early church met every day of the week. Oh, oh, yeah, we could have that discussion, but okay. So do we just say, all right, come to church and that's it. Don't worry. If you read your Bible, great. If you study, wonderful. I'm not going to, I mean, I'm going to encourage you to do it, but it's not required. Now, in some churches, they have a church covenant. And I don't know if you've ever read many of those church covenants. Those church covenants, when people sign those covenants, those church covenants are literally saying you will engage, in many cases they're written this way, in private and family devotions on a regular and consistent basis. Now, I've never understood why anyone would join a church and sign a church covenant. Because to me, what you're setting, basically, if the church is going to have a covenant that everyone has to sign, that literally could be grounds for church discipline. Hey, you signed a church covenant, you're not doing it. Well, if you, if you hand out everyone curriculum and nobody's doing, it, doing anything, you can start questioning whether they're doing anything at all. So if you're going to have a church covenant, you got to hold people to the covenant. What's the, what's the consequences if you don't do any of it? Well, if you, and it, does it work? That's, well, see that the, these three paragraphs in the covenant, you can, you can not follow those and nobody's going to care. You don't actually do family devotions. You don't actually do private devotions. You don't actually study your Bible. That's okay. We're not going to get mad. But over here, number three, if you violate that one, now we're going to church discipline you. I mean, what's even the point? But, but I, I've, I, and I'm just re, I'm questioning this because the reality is a large percentage of professing Christians are not engaged in any meaningful Bible study on a regular and consistent basis. I mean, all the statistics demonstrate this. They're not reading their Bibles. They're not studying their Bibles. They're not doing anything. They're, they're spending time on Facebook, they're spending time on Instagram, they're spending time on YouTube, they're spending time on Netflix, they're spending time on Hulu, Disney Plus, they're, they're spending time doing a, countless other things. They're, they're texting, they're, I don't know why, I mean, they're, 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 they're fun, food, activity, whatever, but it's not serious, 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 serious Bible study. I know that even as a podcaster. Well, look, if I want to get feedback, if I want to get comments, if I want to get my podcast shared, guess what? Turn on the microphone. And let me talk about controversial things. Let's talk about the Delta variant of COVID-19. Let's talk about mask or no mask. Let's talk about what church should, should or shouldn't do. Let's talk about critical race theory. Let's talk about Joe Biden. Let's talk about politics. Let's talk about UFOs. Let's talk about QAnon. I can go through. Oh, boy. Boom, boom. I get those numbers. Hey, guys. But if I, if I say, I'm not going to do all of that, let's do a Bible study exercise. All right, here's what I need you to do. I need you to grab a notebook. I need you to grab a Bible. I'm going to take you through a guided study of this scripture. I'm going to give you things to do. You do the work. You send it back to me, and then we'll work together. All right, everybody ready? Go! And guess, which, guess how su successful those are compared to the others? Not even a comparison. The other things are going to generate the buzz, the, the controversy, and the discussion. Oh, studying God's word? Man, 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 I don't, I, don't, I don't want to really do that. Now, there's always exceptions for people who do participate. Now, guess what it almost always is? It's always women. <laughs> it's almost always women who are doing the Bible study guides. It's always the women who talk about the Bible study. Not, it's usually not the men. Why is that? I, nobody can explain it to me. It's like women like to study women. I, and again, I, I, I've said before so many times. Now, there are always exceptions. There's always exceptions. I'm talking the, the rule, not the exception. I'm going with the rule. The rule is that I have found that it's women who can have deep theological discussions and not men. Now, that's, that, that's, that's a major problem.
Now, so so is the expectation been placed on, on Christians and it's wrong? Now, I, I start thinking of Scripture and I'm like, well, I don't, you know, what do we do with, you know, um, Psalm chapter 1? Where blessed is the man who meditates on God's word day and night. How do we get around the scriptures that seem to infer that we are to meditate on God's word day and night? Do we just throw those out and say, well, those are only for monks, you know, missionaries and ministries or or ministers? So, So meditate on God's word day and night. That's only for monks, missionaries, and ministers. Is, is that what we, is that how we get around that? How do we get around that uh, Psalm 119 and Psalm 19 telling us all the benefits from God's word? You know, um, in, fa- uh, in fact, let me just open up Psalm 19 just to demonstrate this. How do we get around this fact? Okay, okay we can go all through Psalm 119. I mean, you know, what, one of the, I mean, largest chapter in the Bible telling you us all about the importance of God's word. But uh, Psalm 19 We know this, Psalm 19, we sing this in our church. The law of the Lord, God's word, is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired, in other words, God's word, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. So we, we, we read in Psalm 19 all of the, the what God's word is, its, its character, its attributes of what God's word is, what it does, and then we're told we are to desire it more than gold and silver, more than food. Well, is that just for uh, monks, uh, missionaries, and ministers, or is that for the, per- the lay person? If it's for the lay person, then what do we do when you have a church where clearly no one in your church desires God's word above money and food? What do the people actually want? What do they actually want? So there's, there's Psalm 19. Jesus even said that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Or how does that, what is that supposed to look like in the average church member's life? As a newborn babe, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. That seems to be specifically for the average Christian that as a newborn babe, when you become a Christian, you are to now desire God's word like a newborn babe desires milk. Now, guess what? I don't have to look at a newborn baby and say, hey, guess what? You need to desire food. No, it desires it. It wants it. Look, and I will argue this. The desire for food is proof of life and health. If if a newborn baby does not desire food, look, you've got a couple of options. Something is seriously wrong. It is seriously sick. And at some point, if it doesn't desire any food and doesn't ever want to eat again, and it's not doing anything, you may want to make sure it still has a pulse. So, so, So what do you do when you've got church members who don't? They're not reading, they're not studying, they're not doing anything. What are they doing? Now, you could argue, well, here's the thing. They just don't want to study what the church gives them. They don't want, but why wouldn't you want to study what your church is giving you? Because most likely that would, that would give you the greater chance for more food for, for this reason. They're giving you curriculum. They're going to be talking about the curriculum. They're going to be studying the curriculum and all the people around you, if they're studying it, you've got people to talk to about it. Wouldn't that be the most conducive to your spiritual growth? We talk about that we need, our, we need to be, you know, a renewing of our minds. Well, how does a renewing of our minds take place? It's through God's word. It's, I mean, I, I don't know. So, is it required that Christians, I mean, some people say when, with that, that saying that you need to do a daily quiet time, that you need to have daily study. Some people say those are legalistic rules and they need to be thrown out of the church. Is that, do you think that's true? That's just, an, that, that audio clip to me is just another example of, of I don't know what church members actually want. We want in-depth teaching. 
but we're going to stay in a church that doesn't really give it to us because, well, it's nice. It's got this. It's got this. It's got, and, and did you see that little small church over there? That would be embarrassing. I wouldn't want anyone to know that I actually go there. <laughs> no, I'm not going to go. Or, oh, okay. Oh, there's a church that teaches into, okay. Oh, wait a minute. You do. Oh, I don't like this. I don't like this. I don't. And so what do they do? They all usually go back to the church where the teaching is far less in depth. So then do they, do they really want the in-depth teaching? And then, hey, 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 church, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do, we're going to, we're going to give you this Bible study guide. All right. Uh, okay. So nobody's doing, it. okay, okay. All right. That didn't work. Okay. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you, everyone, I'm going to give you, th- okay, well, that didn't work. Okay. Um, all right. Let's try. Okay. Well, that didn't work. Okay. Let's try. Okay. Well, that didn't work. What, at some point, you know, I'm not going to give you anything. And guess what you, you typically are met with when you don't give anyone? You stop all the handouts, all of the curriculum. You stop buying all the curriculum. You know what you're met with? Complete and utter silence. <laughs> Nobody calls and goes, man, people don't walk into church. Where, where's the Bible study guy? Where, where's the devotional for this quarter? I really want that. I really need that. No, oh, okay. I use that. You, you, don't, you don't get told that. And again, I've told you before, you, the call you don't usually get as a pastor is, I want more teaching. I want more church services. You, you don't usually get that. Now, I understand. And, and I'm, just because I'm going to get, I may get some pushback on this. Please understand before you contact me and say, you just don't understand. I'm busy. I have a job. Oh, what, slow down because you don't know my story. I was a bivocational pastor forever, working 40 plus, 40 plus hours a week in the military, and then basically 40 plus hours doing ministry stuff. And then I was doing the, uh, a podcast called News and Focus on top of that. I mean, you were talking like, I mean, it was, I mean, I, I mean, look, I made, I made horrible mistakes and all of that destroyed it, it. You know, ultimately it almost destroyed me, destroyed my family, almost, you know, it well, didn't destroy my family, but hurt my family dramatically hurt. I, I mean, I made a million mistakes in doing all of that. It was overwhelming. So I know about being busy. I know about being busy. All right. I trust me. I know about being completely overwhelmed, but I also know that in 2021, I can, I can do this. 2021, I can open my phone here. I can open my phone. I can pull up an app. I can do this, and then I can immediately just do this. I appreciate that testimony. The devil is, uh, he's, I said it the other night, he's been at this a long time. All right, so I just opened up an app, hit play, the price Jesus paid from a Lafayette Missionary Baptist Church. Now, guess what? I may be busy, but I can play a sermon. I may be busy, but if my church gives me a devotional guide, and I even demonstrated it before in my church that we would do one of the devotionals, uh, like I did it with everyone, and I think it took us, I think, it de- I think I demonstrated that I could read the entire devotional and the text of scripture in between five and 10 minutes. Now, you may not be able to, and, and, and I could grab a, a, a notebook and write something down that, that I learned. That basically, I could do the whole thing between, between 15 to 20 minutes. You can find time. You can find 15 to 20 minutes. You can go to bed 15 to 20 minutes later. You could wake up 15 and 20 minutes earlier. You can pull it off, right? But, but there, so we always have excuses. The issue is what, what do people actually want? Now, in the meantime, while, while we argue and try to figure out what people actually want, the crisis of biblical theological illiteracy and church history illiteracy continues to be an epidemic and nobody has a solution. No one has a solution. And guess what? All we, this, all, it, I see it every single time. When these studies come out and they're like, man, we've got a problem, we've got a problem. Then the next thing you know, I'll get, a, I'll get something from, say, Lifeway or from some one of these curriculum, uh, you know, businesses and they'll send me something going, you know, right now, and sometimes they'll even have the studies going, look, right now your church, 
The people don't know, don't have a biblical worldview. They don't have to do this. So to help resolve that, we've created the following study. Now, here's how it works. Here's the leader's guide, and you can give a piece. And then this will take your church through a six-week or eight-week study that will really try to fix this. Okay, well, your solution is giving people more curriculum that all that everything constantly demonstrates to me that they're not going to use, so it's not going to fix anything other than make you a whole lot of money. Okay. Right, because I, it costs a lot of money if you start buying all your people um, a Bible study guide or any of this curriculum. It can cost money. I mean, you're talking hundreds and hundreds of dollars. The bigger the church, the more money. So I want to hear your stories. Now, if you're a pastor, have you found yourself with the same frustration? Now, you may put yourself in a situation where you never have to find this out. You, you're never going to ask anyone to turn anything in. You're never going to ask anyone if they did it. You're just going to convince yourself that your church is perfect. And, and that's great. If you can live in the land of denial and make yourself feel better, then okay. But usually there, something will ultimately demonstrate nobody's really doing what they, you think they're doing. So, but I want to hear your stories. Well, I went to this small group and man, everyone did the study. It was wonderful. It was awesome. The conversations were great. We, I learned so much. Okay, what, what was the secret? What, 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 what was the secret? Well, no, I've, I've been in Sunday school class after Sunday school class where they give curriculum and nobody comes back prepared. No one's ready to go. Nobody does it. Nobody turns their stuff in. Nobody does anything. I don't even know why we spend the money. I want to hear your, I want to hear your stories because again, The perspective from the pulpit tends to be, here's my perspective from the pulpit. And remember, I did a podcast episode where I read an article from a former pastor who says, you know, that all the studies prove that whatever you preach on Sunday, by next Sunday, the people have already forgotten. So that preaching is, remember, it was called preaching is a waste of time. All, all of these conversations, if you put them all together, this is, this is an interesting discussion, right? Now, you may not find it interesting, but I think it's fascinating because it really looks inside the church and asks, what are you doing behind the pulpit? Do your pastors need to change the way they preach? What are we actually accomplishing in preaching? Do churches need to change their entire structure? What are we accomplishing by spending thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars putting a curriculum and material in people's hands that they're not doing. They're not actually using. They're, they're just getting thrown away. It's laying in the back, back floorboard in their car. Nobody's touched it. Nobody cares. What's the point of spending all of that money? There's been small groups. This country has been covered in small groups. And yet, no matter how many small groups, no matter how many Sunday school classes, no matter how many discipleship groups, What do we find over and over and over? The church is biblically illiterate, theologically illiterate, and illiterate church history. And so then what do you hear? Well, my church won't teach. My church won't give me anything in depth. It's the church's fault. Okay. So then you're like, all right, so where do you go to church? You're like, well, you do realize like about four blocks from where you are. It's a little small church. I think they got like six people. Um, I've heard their teaching. That's some in-depth stuff. Well, and and then you start hearing the excuses. And then when you find out what church do you go to and you start looking on their website and you're like, well, your church, that your church does this and 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 this may not be perfect, but that sounds like a lot of opportunities for spiritual growth. Are you, are you doing the, 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 the studies? Well, you know, they're not really that good. Okay. All right. So what do people really, really, really want? You know what I would prefer? Church members. And Christians who would just say something like this and just be brutally honest. You know what I want? I want to go to church, maybe on Sundays. I want a decent sermon. And here's what I think a decent sermon looks like. And I, that's kind of really it. I don't really want to study. Not going to study. Not going to do anything extra. I may read my Bible a little bit. Probably won't even pick it up this week. I don't really pick it up. I'm not going to listen to sermons. I'm not going to listen to Christian podcasts. I have no desire to listen to anything else. I'm going to listen to the sermon. I do believe in Jesus. I do believe the Bible. I do want a decent sermon, but that's it. I don't want anything else. And I don't care how much you grab at me, nag me, or tell me that it's a requirement. I don't believe it's a requirement. I don't believe the Bible tells me I have to do this. I don't feel guilty and I'm going to do what I want. And I think that's a lot of people's mindset. They don't believe it's a requirement. 
They believe they can just live their life any way they want, basically. And I'm not saying living in sin, but I'm saying when it comes to they don't have to do any of that stuff. That all of that stuff about God's word, meditate day and night, as a newborn babe, study to show yourself approved, man does not live by bread alone, that that's for, again, monks, missionaries, and ministers, not for them. And they believe that all of that yelling and complaining is basically being like a Pharisee and you're trying to put them under a burden. I, I, I think some church members just need to be honest with that. And I, I, it's, I, I don't know what this means going forward. I think, I think people are, we have more available to us than at any time in the history of the church. And we have seemingly less engagement with all of the content that we have available. And all of these ministries that try to provide the content, I think they're constantly scrambling, like, what do we do? What do we do? How do we fix this problem? 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 The ministry back to the Bible that originated in Lincoln, Nebraska. I used to listen to that thing every single day, back to the Bible, back to the Bible. That ministry was major influential in me. Uh, and and they're, they're constantly worried about how do we get people back to the Bible? How do we get people back into the Bible? As far as I know, uh, now I don't live in Nebraska. Maybe it still comes on the radio. They used to have the podcast. Um, it's, for all practical purposes, it looks like it's gone. I think there's a Back to the Bible Canada uh, the one in Lincoln, Nebraska now, I think, is like a 10-minute podcast. It's just gone. So what did they accomplish in all of their efforts and all of those years trying to get people back to the Bible? Did they actually get people back to the Bible? I, I don't know. So there you go. I, I I don't even know how to classify this podcast. Is it is this something... I, I don't know. You, you'll you tell me. I, you know what? I'm probably going to be met with a resounding silence about this subject, but it's it's something that I've just struggled with my whole Christian life before I became a pastor and after a pass and after I became a pastor. I've always struggled like, what do people really, really want? I don't get it. And I would find myself in those, you know, those settings going, so no, and I, and, and again, I'm not even a pastor at that point. I'm not even the teacher. And I'm like, so no one did anything? I, I, I'll give you a, a last example. For over, well over 20 years, I've taught 12 uh, methods of Bible study. 12 methods of Bible study. And I have taught these methods, I, it feels like a thousand times. I don't even know how many times. And guess what? I think 95% of anyone who's ever done any, now I don't think I've ever had anyone actually do all 12 methods of Bible studies and then send them to me for me to check. Um, but in all of my years of teaching them, I've taught them in church settings, Sunday school settings. I've taught them on the internet. I've taught them everywhere, right? Um, and all of the years, no one has sent me, no one has ever participated in all 12 methods and then sent me their studies to show me what they did so that I could look at it and grade it. Um, I, but in, I think in 95%, the ones that were sent to me were always sent to me by women. And, and if you look at the Bible study methods taught, those were some of the most unsuccessful podcast episodes I've ever created. I could do a podcast about the Chupacabra in Texas and have get more downloads than I could about teaching someone 12 methods of actual Bible study to actually get them into the scriptures, teaching them how to study the Bible on their own actual methods, step by step. Here's step one, here's step two, here's step three. But if I do a, a podcast about the chupacabra in Texas, ooh, chupacabra, I've heard about this myth, you know, mystical, mythical creature. Ooh, that's it. Ooh, if I do a podcast about the Roswell UFO crash, ooh, I could probably get some downloads. Oh, you want me to learn how to study the Bible and then you want me to actually study the Bible and then you want to actually send you the study that I did? No, 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 no. You're out of your mind. What, what do Christians want? Now, from my understanding, there are Christians in other parts of the world who are starving for study material. They are starving for, for, for Bible study. They are starving. Maybe the only thing that's going to fix Amer the American church is we get in a situation where everything's taken from us. Everything's taken from us. 
You don't have sermons to listen to. You don't have Bible study material. You don't have anything. Everything's taken from you. You can't sit at home and listen. You're going to actually have to go back to church. Maybe the only solution is to take it all from us so that we basically wake up one day and there's a famine in the land. And it's not a famine for food. It's a famine for God's word. Then people will get hungry for it. And then people will start starving for it. Maybe we need to pray that it's all taken from us. Then maybe people will actually go home and actually do their study because they, they can't wait to study God's word. Or is this just an example of basically we've grown cold and apathetic and dead and we don't desire it. We don't hunger it. We don't love, we don't have a hunger for it. We don't have a love for it. I don't know. I've witnessed this my whole Christian life. I don't, I've never been able to exp- understand it. I've never been able to understand it. No one had to tell me to, to study God's word. No one, no one ever had to tell me to do any of this. Stuff. It was like, I want to study God's word. I want to study God's word. I want to study God's word. Now, do I struggle with putting other things before it? Oh, absolutely. Everyone knows I love music. Sometimes music takes a priority and I have to struggle and go, man, that's, I got to get, I got to get back into God's word. I got to, okay, I love you. Everybody knows I'm not here to get into an argument about my entertainment choices. I love professional wrestling. I love the storytelling. I love the characters. Sometimes I have to struggle going, wait a minute. Okay, I got to put God's word first, God's words first. And I've had to work out, you know, sometimes my solution is, you know what? I spent too much time today doing other things. You know what? I'm going to, I'm going to stay up three, four. I'm going to go without sleep and I'm going to make up for it. And I, and I hope that I know it, it doesn't come across as a pharisaical legalistic requirement, but it should be like, I need God's word. I'm a sinner who struggles and I've got success in my life and I've got long stretches of failure in my life. I need God's word. I need God's word, not because I'm better than everyone else. It's because maybe, maybe because I'm weaker than it. Maybe, maybe, maybe the reason other people don't need God's word is they're, they're just better Christians than me. I'm a mess. I'm a failure. I'm up and down. Maybe I need God's word. I don't know. I don't know what the issue is. But it's a very, 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 very important discussion. And when I hear a pastor going, did, did anyone turn them? Two people? Come on, guys. Okay, I'll, I'll save the rebuke at the end. That's him realizing, okay, if I, if I just go off on a rebuke now, I'm going to ruin this. He, he, he made a very wise decision. I probably would have gotten so frustrated that I would have ruined the whole lesson. Because sometimes you just have, you know, part of me, I would have said, you know what? Forget it. Forget it. Don't turn them in. Don't, don't hand any more out. We're, we're just going to stop this. And I would have just, I would have just did an impromptu study on something else. I would have just said, forget it. Forget it. I'm wasting my time. I'm wasting your time. Let's just throw the whole thing out. Just throw the whole thing out. Just forget it. Just forget it. It's a waste of time. Now, obviously there could be some situation in the church which would explain no one turning them in, but I'm just saying the pastor did not express an understanding. He didn't understand why nobody was turning them in. And again, why is it a woman turning it? And I, now I praise God for godly women, but it, it's just like, I don't understand where the men are who are hungry, have a hunger and studying for God's word. And what example are we leaving for the younger generation? I, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I really don't. I, I could talk about this for hours, just trying to figure it out because I just, I just, my brain, when, when I, when I heard that audio clip, I can't, I was in my study and I come walking out and I was told my wife, I'm like, I cannot believe, and I just, and I started explaining it to her and, and I played part of it for her. And I was like, you can just, and I was just like, I was so upset. And so at my, I mean, I, my heart was racing, my blood pressure was getting up, and I was just like, you know what, I can't, I can't do this, I can't do this, because this just makes me so angry, because I have just experienced this my whole Christian life in so many different ways, and I don't know what people actually want. But I can tell you what they need, unless I'm convinced otherwise, they need the Word of God. I mean, why, why else would God give us his revelation in written form? I would assume it's because we're supposed to study it. I, I, I thought the word of God was, I don't know, our sword. I don't know. All right, I'll stop right there. You can email me your thoughts, newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif, uh, newsif at yahoo.com. 
newsif at yahoo.com. I guess we can just refer to this as our a, the Theology Central rant. Maybe this is just more a rant and you probably are just going to disregard it. I hope that somehow in this rant I, I, that I, I've said something that maybe will just make you question a lot about uh, so many things and maybe it was benefit. Maybe it was beneficial. I don't know. I don't know, but I'll, I'll be happy to get, I, I really do need your, again, I've said it before. It's the perspective in the pew that all pastors need to hear. Because I bet you some of you in the pew go, no, nah, you know, you, you know, when pastors are like, you need to do this, you need to study this. I'm just, I'm not going to do it because I don't want to be told what to do. And I don't think you can be t- giving me these rules. I, I need to hear that. I know some people like you express that and then you feel bad for expressing it, but don't feel bad because I need to know what you're feeling. It's not about justifying the feeling. It's not about saying the feeling is right. It's about truly trying to understand what is going on because something has been broken for a very long time. And sometimes we need to discuss what's broken. Just like sometimes I have to discuss what's broken in my own life, right? We, we, sometimes we all need to look in the mirror. I mean, right now, all we want to do is run around and fight critical race theory. I think the church is so broken. I don't know why we're fighting critical race theory. We won't even study the Bible. <laughs> okay, Let's fight critical race theory. How about let's figure out how to get Christians to actually study their Bible on a regular and consistent basis. Maybe that to me is more of a issue than all the other things the church wants to fight about. But see, that's going to turn into a different podcast. So I'm going to stop talking. Everyone have a great day. I should be back on the air here shortly. God bless.